can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to turn the webcast over to Lance. All right, Carol. Hey, folks, thank you for joining us and welcome. My name is Lance Spitzner, and today we'll be talking about securing your kids online. Now, I know our time is precious, so let's go ahead and jump right in. First of all, about your speaker, I've been in cybersecurity for over 20 years. The first 10 years was very much on the technical side, but the past 10 years have been focused very much on the human side. So my job and passion is working with organizations around the world, helping them secure their employees. But a key part of that job is also working with the community in that not only how can organizations secure their workforce and their employees, but something that I'm very passionate about is how can we as parents help secure our kids online and safely and securely make the most of technology. So it's something else I've been working on for many years also. And just as important, and just like many of you, I myself have three kids. So right now I've got one freshman in college, I've got a sophomore in high school, and I have a 10 year old in third grade. So some of the many challenges we're gonna be talking about here, I have already experienced and or already experiencing. So with that said, I'd like to go ahead and jump right in. Now, a key part of this talk is this. This is not a doom and gloom talk about, oh, the internet is horrible, be careful what your kids do, no. Technology is an amazing thing, and this is gonna become a key part of their lives, both you know, for work, socially, and now obviously for e-learning, learning from home. So this goal, talk, the whole purpose of today is, hey, we want to enable kids to make the most of technology. We just want to enable them to make it safely and securely. And for the security geeks out there, if I have a lot of highly technical people, you're going to see when it comes to protecting kids online, it's a little different than protecting data at an organization. Because in a lot of ways, we're not protecting data. We're protecting reputations. We're protecting futures. So the risks are a little different. And how we manage those risks are a little different. So if you're very technical, please keep in mind the approach with kids are going to be a little different. And in fact, let's start with the why. What is the difference? And what is the threat model? When it comes to kids today, what should we be concerned about? Well, first and foremost, one of the biggest challenges we all face is this. Traditionally, in the history of parenting for the past thousands and thousands of years, we as parents experienced things as kids, we grew up, and then we passed those lessons learned down to our kids. But we're very in a unique situation as parents because for most of us, we did not grow up in a highly connected environment. So our kids are growing up in a situation, in an environment that we never grew up in. So for us parents, no matter how technically savvy we are, there are some very unique challenges because what they're going through, we've never experienced. All right, so one of the key things I like to do is when I'm dealing with any type of risk model, and that's what we're doing is, well, what should I be worried about? And so what we're gonna do is cover the top three most common risks, or I should say threats, to our kids today. Lance, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, uh, I'm getting some messages from quite a few people that they cannot hear the webcast. Um, do you mind pausing just for one moment so I can sort out if this is happening? If anyone can hear me or Lance, please let me know in the questions window. Uh, Lance, if I don't get any response from this, I'm going to have to look into it. Give me a moment, please. Sure. Yeah, because right now my I'm showing uh, fine for bandwidth. I just sent a message in the chat window too. Uh, people do see the slides advancing. Oh, 
but you can hear me, right? I can hear you, yeah. Okay, okay, so I can, audio is just fine for me. I can see slides, hear the audio. Okay, uh, some people are saying no, some people are saying yes. So I'm going to have you go ahead and continue, Lance. I'll guide the others through, and of course they can uh, listen to it in the archive. So please excuse the interruption. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things me and my family were talking about this morning is right before going online is this is going to be a growing problem at a national, if not a global scale. I mean, everybody's going online, both for work, e-learning, entertainment, staying in touch. So all the ISPs are pretty hammered right now. In fact, right before this webcast, I had to announce to my family, all right, no downloading. All right, so let's go back because this will be recorded. So we have three threat models, strangers, friends, and kids, our kids themselves. I wanna very briefly go over each of these three threat models because by better understanding them, you can better understand how we can enable our kids to make the most of the internet safely and securely. So let's start with the most common one because when we think of kids online, everybody always thinks of strangers. Yep, notice we got the guy in the dark hoodie. You know, we're totally going with the common stereotype here. And there's a reason why. When we as parents tend to think of threats to our kids, we tend to focus on the strangers, the people that, bad guys that our kids don't know, that, that might meet online, such through online gaming, and then we're worried about things like sexual predators, extortion, fraud, things like that. Now, this is a threat. This is a risk we have to be concerned about. This is something we're gonna have to teach our kids about. But two things. One, law enforcement is actively on our side. They're targeting these bad guys. They're shutting down these bad guys. If you run into a situation where one of your kids is talking to a stranger online and they start acting creepy, weird, your kids are concerned, you can go to law enforcement for help. So while this is a threat we need to be concerned about, what I don't want is you just focusing on this and not focusing on the other two. Because based on my experience, the probability of one of the other two threats causing harm is far more likely. And the other two are our kids' friends and then our kids themselves. So when it comes to our kids' friends, we need to be worrying about things like cyber bullying things like sextortion, kids exchanging naked pictures of each other or you know, using extortion to exchange pictures, ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend, or the kids setting, uh, friends setting bad examples online, such as swearing, doing something illegal, excessive gaming, Their, our fr kids' friends are online at night. And the challenge you have is in most of these situations, law enforcement can't help. So if one of your kids is being cyber bullied or something along those lines, a lot of times law enforcement can't get involved unless there's actual physical danger or there's reason to believe physical danger. And the other problem we have is with these type of threats is they can be exponentially worse. So for example, in junior high, I was this skinny little nerd that all the bullies and jocks like to beat up in the gym wasn't fun, didn't enjoy junior high. But you know what? When I was getting beat up and when I was getting bullied, the only people that saw it were the ones in the gym. Nowadays, when you get into things like cyber bullying, it can be exponentially worse for our kids because it's literally all over the internet. So we wanna be sure that we can identify these type of situations and control them before they get out of hand. And these can be very emotionally damaging to our children. Remember, I told you earlier, the key thing we're protecting here is not data. We're protecting reputations, we're protecting future, we're protecting emotions. So this is something else we have to be concerned about, is are the friends or and or individuals our kids are interacting with. But finally, we need to be aware of that sometimes our kids can be the own worst enemy. For example, Maybe they have bad public behavior. Maybe they're the ones swearing online, bullying others, making, um, hurting others, setting that bad example. Once again, remember, with the internet, it's exponentially worse because everyone sees it. 
It can be recorded, it can be archived. Once on the internet, it stays there forever. Or perhaps they're, you know, they're accessing and sharing inappropriate content, so, you know, adult-oriented content. Maybe they're sharing license, well, protected content, uh, copyrighted material. And then sometimes we have that challenge of them being up to three in the morning gaming online, and then they wake up the next morning utterly exhausted, unable to study, cranky, not getting along with people. So quite often, and this is the one we typically forget. We're so focused on those strangers as a bad guy that we tend to forget our kids can be their own worst enemy when they go online. So we have strangers, we have friends, and then we have our kids themselves. Now there's one common theme though with all of these risks. And it's really not so much about hacking data or protecting data. The common theme with all of these risks is communication. You think about it, bad guys, strangers, communicating with our kids, friends, how are they communicating online? How are they communicating to our kids? Our children, how are they communicating with others, behaving with others, and interacting with others? So what I tend to find is the biggest risk, the biggest issue with kids online, and it doesn't matter if they're six years old, 16 years old, or whatever, is the communication, how they're interacting with others. So our biggest challenge is communication, but the biggest solution is actually communication. So what can we as parents do to help manage these risks and enable our kids to take, make the most of technology today? First and foremost, education. Now, if you were joining this webcast, hoping that I would say buy product X, install product X, and your problems are taken care of, you're going to be disappointed. We are gonna cover technology in a little bit, but you can't outsource parenting. Ultimately, the risks that our children face online are actually very similar to the risks our kids face in the physical world. They're just potentially a little exponentially worse. So what happens is the solution to this is not installing an app. It's not installing a firewall. It's talking to your kids, setting expectations, teaching them good values, teaching them how they're expected to behave and interact with others, what they can and can't share with others. Ultimately, it's a two-way dialogue. You talking to your kids and kids talking to you. And the key thing here is the earlier you start the dialogue, the better. So if your child's 16 and you decide then and there, okay, I'm gonna start teaching them how to behave online. That's way too late. You're far better instead of at 16, you wanna start much earlier, such as at six. And one of the best ways I have found to have that communication and dialogue is ask them what they're doing. So my oldest right now, he's 19. And many, many years ago, when I had my first child, I thought, oh, this securing kids online, this is easy. I'm a technology, I'm a, not only me, I'm a technology expert, I'm a security expert. I mean, back then I was beta testing firewalls. I had like a $20,000 vendor firewall I was beta testing for the vendor in my home network. I mean, I was like, how many parents have a $20,000 firewall at home? Probably not many. Quickly discovered, didn't matter. So first of all, technology changes so fast for kids, I couldn't come up, I couldn't keep up. They adapt, there's the new app, there's a new program every six months. So when I thought, this is a, not a big issue. I can stay ahead of a curve. I was quickly crushed and learned huh, I'm always going to be behind the curve. So one of the best ways I learned to really start that dialogue with kids and that accepted behavior is ask them what they're doing online. Hey, what mobile apps are you using? What do you see your friends using? Who's doing what? Now, if you start this dialogue when they're 17 years old, you're probably not going to get a lot out of them. But if you start this dialogue when they're six years old, you can start you know, the building that trust and communication. So my third grader, one of the things I discovered is one of his favorite apps that him and his friends are playing with is stop motion animation. In other words, they get together, they play with their Legos all day, and they keep them, take pictures and they make movies by taking these pictures, move the Lego a little, take a picture, move it a little, take a picture. 
and they love making these videos. Now, as they get older, they start using apps to communicate with each other, you know, the infamous Snapchat, message, Google, whatever. So what ends up happening is start with education. If you teach them the behaviors, if you teach them the values and the expectations, and you have that open communication between them and you, overall, you're going to be fine. You're really going to manage those risks. Like I said, we're going to get into technology a little bit, but technology has certain limitations. So if anything else, this right here is probably the most important slide. Now, a couple of things we can do. One of the things we like to do is have a dedicated computer for the kids. Now, in the old days, 10 years ago, this was pretty much all you needed. Before, you know, 2007, when mobile devices became popular and things like that, you would have just a dedicated computer for the kids, and that's where they would work, especially for younger kids, so you could watch what they were doing. I would say nowadays, this is probably less and less applicable. I don't know about your kids, but all of mine got Chromebooks for school. So they don't so much use the family computer as they have their own Chromebooks. So have a place for them where they can use the computer. That way, if they're having problems, you can help them, but you can also watch their emotions and behavior. So, you know, if they start getting sad, a little quiet or upset while they're on the computer, you can quickly pick up something didn't go well online. So perhaps maybe one of your kids is gaming online and then there's some bullies online gaming with your kid online. And all of a sudden your child, you know, starts crying, is a little upset. By quickly picking up and talking to it, you could quickly identify there were some kids who were mean online, bullying in them, which actually is quite common in gaming, especially if older kids get on a game with younger kids. So having that visibility, especially when the kids are younger, um, you can do that. Another option is if your kids aren't using a Chromebook, maybe if you can have a dedicated computer just for the kids, something separate from you and your wife, because potentially they can accidentally mess up or infect that computer. If nothing else, if you are sharing a computer with your kids, which is fine, make sure their accounts when they log in are non-privileged i.e. it's not admin, root, whatever. That way, when they make a mistake, it's just localized to their account, as opposed to if they have an admin account and something bad happens, it could take over the entire operating system. So one of the things I recommend is have a dedicated spot for them, A, to have either a shared computer or where they use their own computer and where you can keep and watch them, especially when they're younger. I'd say elementary school, maybe junior high. Um, when they get into high school, they may need their own computer in their own room. Um, I don't know about you guys, but uh, mine that are in high school or in college, <laughs> they go to bed after me. So you know what, just go to your room and study so I can go to bed. Now, a couple other things too is mobile devices. Now, this is really probably the big challenge here. A couple of things, what we found works well in our family is, especially for the younger kids, have a central charging station, family charging station. The reason we're doing that is what we really want, don't want happening is your 10 year old going to bed with an iPad and then using it until two in the morning or texting friends or things like that. So remove that temptation and then have that central charging station. Okay, kids, time to go to bed. All the mobile devices go to the central charging station. Now, what you don't want to do is make that charging station your bedroom because sometimes the devices might go off, either that or you shut them off. So if your central charging station is mom and dad's bedroom, turn the mobile devices off and or put it somewhere else to the side where if a device goes off, it won't work you up. And you may want some rules. So, for example, a key rule we quickly identified is, hey, when the kids leave with a mobile device, especially the older ones, when mom or dad text, you have to respond. All right. Uh, we once had a situation where one of our kids went out. Yeah, we were texting and they never responded. And then when they got home, they're like, oh, yeah, well, I was gaming all day and my device just died. So we quickly had to put an end to that and say, if you want the trust to leave this house with a mobile device, you have to prove yourself trustworthy. And part of that is 
ensuring you always have a charged device and you always respond to mom or dad. So you begin to see here, it's not technology, it's these whole idea of expectations, values, and behaviors. Really just like I said in the real world. So a couple of tricks on mobile devices. Now, something on e-learning. All right, so to be honest, all the lessons learned we're talking about apply to the e-learning world, but really anything online. All e-learning really is, is an extension of the kids' already existing digital world. As we know, all of our kids are growing up totally online. E-learning just takes it one step further. So everything I'm talking about is not specific to e-learning. It's specific to how to be secure online, but let's just quickly address the e-learning issue. So I'm sure we're all struggling with trying to figure out how to do this, have a daily routine with breaks so the kids always know, hey, we're gonna start at 9 a.m., we'll take a break for lunch, things like that. And I'll be honest, what I'm finding with e-learning is the younger the kids are, the more interaction and support it's gonna take for you. So for, like I said, we have a third grader. That's taking a lot of hand-holding from mom and dad, especially mom. Um, I have a, a sophomore in high school. He's pretty much got this down. And then I've got a freshman in college who's actually in engineering school. He was telling me the funny story. That he goes to University of Illinois. said when it was announced the university was going to shut down and go to e-learning because he was in all engineering classes and STEM classes about two hours after the announcement came out, all of his teachers are like, Yep, we're all online, ready to go, because they're all computer engineering courses and things like that. So for the college student, e-learning, not an issue. The high school student, taking a couple of steps. What I'm tending to find is for the elementary, it's a little bit more challenging. So one of the things, too, is we're having our older kids help coach and tutor the younger ones, especially how to use technologies like Zoom. Um, we can do virtual play dates. So, cause you know, with the whole quarantine thing right now, maybe the kids can play online, but with other friends using things like Zoom, Skype, Slack. And what's sad is they probably know how to use this stuff better than you and me. A couple other things, A, keep track what the teachers are emailing and communicating. It's probably changing on a daily basis right now because the teachers are having to scramble and figure this all out. So you, what you may want to do is read those emails, review them in the morning with your kids for the plan of attack and in the evening. Now, my sophomore brought up one point and he said he's already seeing this. We expect good behavior for our kids in school. We want to see good behavior for our kids with e-learning. And he brought up an interesting point. He's starting to see some of the more mischievous or even you know bad behavior kids. They'll do things like during an online e-learning session, where there's Zoom and everybody's talking to each other and video conferencing, some kids will take screenshots and then make fun of other kids with these screenshots when kids were looking goofy and things like that. So once again, this is where we wanna teach kids good behaviors, we wanna teach them good values because the technology changes so much and the situations change so rapidly. If we teach them specific to the technology, the lessons quickly Fade out. They have no. Um, they won't work anymore because the situations change so much. So we really need to focus on those core values, those core foundations, those core behaviors. That way, regardless of the specific technology or situation, we know the kids are behaving well. And that's like I said. Quite often, we focus on strangers as a threat, but in reality, it's the kids' friends or themselves when they misbehave online that the greatest harm happens. So e-learning, nothing more than extension of their already existing online activities. We just wanna be sure they exhibit those good behaviors. And the younger the kid is, more likely the more guidance and handholding it's gonna take from your end. Something you may wanna do, and these are an example of, like I said, when you expect certain behaviors of your kids online, what you may wanna do is document them. So things like when kids can or cannot be online, how long they can be online for, what they can and can't do online. Something we have found fantastically effective, tie the use of device to grades. So say, hey, you grades go below a certain level. That demonstrates you don't have good um, responsibility. 
that you may be sh going online too much and things like that. So you know you can say, hey, you go below an A, you go below a B, don't have access to your device anymore, go below a C, we, you know, we take your devices away, period, no online, whatever. Simply tie grades to the use of devices and you have a fantastic control mechanism. Think about it. The one good thing about kids' online addiction, if you will, but how the whole life goes online is you've got one single pain point. It's very easy to inflict pain on kids. So if you need to do that, tie that to the grades. And remember, having a mobile device is not a right. It is a privilege. They have to demonstrate the responsibility and the maturity equal to the access they have to those devices. A couple other things too, you know, who or what to report questions or concerns. Once again, that's that communication. We want kids, we want to be sure our kids feel comfortable. You know, this person's a little creepy. I met somebody online. They're starting to, you know, make me scared. Make sure your kids feel comfortable approaching you. And so you can create a very simple contract of the rules they expect. This may sound odd, but I actually recommend if you do de um, thought, define and document the rules, have them sign the document. Having them sign the document creates an far more likely that they will follow the rules. There's all sorts of psychological research in human behavior. Signing that document, far more likely to follow those rules. If you're interested, one of the best uh, uh, psychological analysis of this is a book called Influence by uh, Dr. Robert Cialdini. The other thing too is what I like to do is I like to um, have print out the, the document, have them sign the document, and then hang it on their door. That way they can't ever say, well, I didn't know. And by the way, remember, the rules change over time. As your kids get older, the rules will change. So the document I would have for a third grader would be very different than somebody in junior high or high school. All right, once again, we've been focusing a lot on the behaviors and expectations, but something we can't forget is grandma. Because grandma's is Vegas for kids. In fact, what happens at grandma's stays at grandma's. So we've got to make sure that we let grandma know what the expectations are. So if you have a third grader spending the night at grandma's, we've got to make sure, hey, grandma, he can't play these games. You know, the last thing you want is your kid, you know, three, uh, third grader, you know, going online and playing some of these shoot 'em up games, things like that. Um, also, you know, grandma, he's got to go to bed by nine o'clock. When my kids were growing up, if they ever wanted a the, the games they used to play, like World of Tanks and things like that, if they ever wanted to buy a package or buy something inside the game, they quickly learned not to ask mom or dad if they wanted to buy something in the game. They quickly learned play the game at grandma's and then ask grandma and grandma would just give them their credit card and they can get whatever they want at grandma's. So just be wary. You may have all these rules, guidelines, and expectations. Are those being enforced at other families, especially grandma and grandpa? All right, now I promised I'd talk about technology because technology can help, but I also wanna cover its limitations. Key thing, like I said, if you thought you could just buy a mobile app and you were done, I'm going to disappoint you. So when it comes to technology, technology, for those of us that are security geeks, it's just like at the office. You can either filter or you can monitor. And you can actually do both. And filtering is all about what kids can and can't do online, who they can talk to, what websites they can connect to, what games they can and can't play, things like that. So first of all, Filtering is good for younger kids, like my third grader. I probably wouldn't do filtering for high school and above. A couple of reasons why. Once they start getting older, A, they need access to more. They need access for education. They need access, you know, that access driver's permit, things like that. Maybe they're in all sorts of sports, after school activities, robotics, cheerleading, swimming, whatever. And a lot of times they need to go online and maintain all that themselves. So what happens is as they get older, I tend to find filtering is less and less valuable. And what I really tend to find is filtering is the most valuable for us. It's helped prevent kids from accidentally accessing 
harmful content, something that might scare them, freak them out, things like that. So it protects more from accidental. The other challenge you have is certain websites are their own ecosystem. And then you have to go in and manually filter each one of them. Like YouTube, Netflix, Steam, it's a gaming platform, Snapchat, things like that. So as your kids get older and they start accessing all these different ecosystems, it's once again, it gets harder and harder and harder to filter them. And for example, YouTube, even if you control and limit what videos your kids can see, sometimes it's not the videos that are the issue, it's the comments that are in the issue. So filtering, good what I tend to find for younger kids, but as they get older and older, it tends to be less and less effective. Uh, a fantastic way to implement filtering at your house is there are DNS services that will help protect you and your family from visiting malicious or harmful websites. Uh, a very famous one is called OpenDNS.org. So if you're going to do any type of filtering, highly, highly recommend this website, uh, not website, this DNS service. Uh, but keep in mind, this only works when kids are at your home network. When they go to school, a friend's house, so they, say perhaps they're accessing the internet by uh, um, their phone. As they get older, they can tether off their phone and things like that. This won't be as effective. So great at home, but keep in mind, once they leave home, it becomes harder and harder to filter that activity. The other one is monitoring. Mon there are solutions, technology solutions, where you can monitor everything the kids do on their phone. Pictures they take, websites they go to, text messages with friends. If you're going to monitor, A, start at an early age, when they're six. It's very hard to tell a 16-year-old, hey, I'm going to start monitoring everything you do. Two, be prepared. You're going to be overwhelmed by a lot of data. Just like corporations, when they set up monitoring systems, you're going to be overwhelmed with a lot, a lot of data. I tried it out. I was monitoring my, um, let's see here, my third grader, and I quickly discovered he liked Lego movies, Lego YouTube videos, things like that. If you're going to want to monitor everything your kids do with their mobile devices, you're probably going to have to go Android. The issue is with Apple, there are some parental controls, and a lot of them are built in. But it's really hard to implement technologies that will track, record, and report everything they do. Now, I've got examples of technologies you can install. Android, because of how Android is developed, these programs get access to the lowest levels of the operating system and enable you to track everything that they do. So if you want some tracking, some parental controls, Apple has that. If you want to go all the way by third party and track every single thing they do, by all means, go with that. Now, once again, I want to caution you. This is probably going to work very well for younger kids. But as kids get older, they can probably come up with ways to get around this. So example, you know, you can have all the best filtering, you can have all the best monitoring. But what happens when the school issues your kids devices and they're using those devices? What happens when your kids go next door to a friend's house and when they start getting older and they start going to parties? So my 16 year old, he says a lot of his friends, they'll have parents that monitor everything that they do. Well, not a lot, he's got some friends where parents will install software and monitor everything they do on those devices. So what do those kids do? They simply get a loaner phone from one of maybe their friends. Because don't forget, sometimes kids, when they get, they'll get a new mobile device, what happens to the old mobile device? It just goes into storage. So kids will barter, trade, and share unused mobile devices. So kids that are heavily monitored will have a mobile device from you, the parent, and then you'll see them doing what they want you to see. And then they'll have a mobile device that a friend gave them or somebody shared to them and things like that. Or maybe they're just using an iPad or some other device, things like that. All I wanted to caution you is it's getting easier and easier and easier for kids nowadays to bypass a lot of monitoring technologies, a lot of filtering technologies. So when they get older, they need more access. 
but it's also for them easier to bypass those controls. That's why I always come back to start at an early age, build that trust, build those good behaviors, build those good foundations, values, things like that. And as they get older, they're gonna get thrown a lot of weird situations that filtering or monitoring won't take care of. And if they don't have those good behaviors and those good values, they're probably going to end up being their own worst enemy. So technology can help, but I tend to find it's only for the younger. As they get older, especially maybe high school and college, it's, yeah, it's uh, not going to be the example. It's not going to be the solution you may think. Finally, as parents, hey folks, we've got to set the example. So a couple of things like what I like to do. When I'm at the computer or I have my device and my kids ask me something, I always turn away from the computer and or put the device down. Look them in the eyes. They help understand eye contact is key when you're talking to each other. Don't pull out your mobile device at the dinner table, at the breakfast table. Um, obviously, no texting while driving. And behave on the internet, internet like you want your kids to. All right. We want to set the example in how we use technology and how they use technology also. Okay, this was fast and furious. A couple of key steps I recommend when you get back with your kids. So first of all, like I said, ultimately the key thing is having that daily conversation with them. Making sure you're not only talking to them, but they're talking to you. Ask them what mobile apps they're using. How do they communicate? How are they e-learning? What apps do they like? What apps don't they like? What are they seeing their friends doing? Is there anything scary, creepy going online? Create that central charging station for mobile devices and maybe have that central place for them to use their school computer or give them a computer. Perhaps create and document those expectations of kids. You'll be online. Maybe tie computer usage to their grades and specify those grades. Write a simple contract have them sign that simple contract. You know what, if, they're, if you're about to get them a new iPhone, tell them, hey, no new iPhone, no new smartphone, no new tablet until we work together on this contract and agree on it. And if you're not sure what the rules should be, A, there's a lot of examples on the internet, but B, work with your kids together. Hey, what do you think of this rule? What, you know, things along those lines. And then finally, like I said, try to set that a good example. When your kids stop, uh, when, your kids need to talk to you. Stop using that technology and look them in the eyes. If you wanna learn more about securing kids or just securing your home in general, highly recommend the Ouch Security Awareness Newsletter. It's published every month in 20 languages. A free download, share with your family and friends. We have articles on how to secure your kids, but how to secure your home network, what's a VPN, all sorts of fantastic information. So if you want to keep learning more, recommend sans.org slash ouch. All right, let's do this. Carol, let me know if we have any questions or even better, if you have any tricks, suggestions, or lessons learned that's worked well for you with helping secure your kids online and or with e-learning. So questions or even better suggestions. So Carol, what do we have? All right, thanks for your great presentation. We do have a few questions ready here. Uh, the first one is, uh, what's the author's last name of the book, Influence? Is it? Uh, oh, Influence, Cialdini? okay. Yeah, it's Robert Cialdini. And Cialdini, it's, okay. Yeah, Cialdini, but it's C-I-A, not C-H-A, C-I-A. And he's written a very famous book called Influence. And the only reason I happen to know this book and many of the others is I use these type of books to help develop my SAN, because I've written two SANS courses on how to secure the human element. And Robert Cialdini is one of the researchers we reference in the class, but it just so happens in his research, one of the key six ways of changing human behavior is getting you to actually sign a document. All right, thanks. Uh, Lance, this next one is rather long, so I put it in the questions window so you could take a look too. It says, with web browsers implementing DNS over HTTPS, DOH, 
well, <laughs> they put that in parentheses, uh, by default, Firefox, for example, the use of DNS filtering is not going to be possible. This means it affects devices like Pi-hole and blockers and blacklist blockers like PF blocker, NG, in P, uh, I think it says PSense firewalls. Any thoughts on filtering alternatives? Okay, so first of all, keep in mind, there is no one single filtering solution that is going to solve all your problems. Now, when they're six years old, absolutely, because you control the environment they work in. They get one iPad or one tablet and they use it in your home network. But when they get to be 10, 15 years old, what happens when they're using school devices? What happens when they're next door playing on the gaming box? What happens when they tether off a friend's mobile device? So what I'm gonna say is there is no single solution that is going to help identify and do global filtering. And this is why I always get back to communication. I like open DNS, um, DNS over HTTPS and things like that, that's gonna create some unique solutions. But ultimately, if you're going to, it doesn't matter the protocol, if it's still talking to the DNS server, those DNS servers know what websites to block. So to answer this specific technology question, I don't know the answer because I haven't tested the technology, but to me, I don't think it would matter what protocol is being used to talk to the DNS server because the DNS server will reply, oh, that's a bad website, don't connect to it in DNS fashion. So long story short, I don't have a specific technical answer to the technical question because I haven't tested the specific technology, but I just wanna re-emphasize no single technology is gonna be able to implement all of your filtering needs, especially as kids get older. All right, thanks. Uh, a couple of people have said thank you. Uh, one specifically says, wow, all very common sense suggestions. Much appreciate. Whoop, it scrolled out of view. Uh, and, and, much Carol, the insight wanna, to the older kids. Yeah, and I just wanted to bring up one key thing, that common sense thing. So before I did this webcast, I went to my 19-year-old because he's been through all of this. And I said, okay, I'm on a webcast. I'm going to teach parents how to secure their kids. You've seen it all. You've done it all. Every bad thing you could do online, he's done online, and that we, we've all, all these learned from all these events. And I said, what's one key thing I could tell parents? And he said, common sense. He said, it's not a technical solution, it's a values and behavior solution. It's ultimately about common sense. All right, what else? All right, thanks, sorry. Uh, do you have any specific recommendations regarding security of school equipment, for example, Chromebooks, that our children have brought home for distance learning? So good question. What I tend to find is for most school districts, including my child's, is they're already heavily locked down. They have built-in filtering capabilities. They can only visit certain websites from the Chromebook. They can only stall and run certain applications from the Chromebook. So what I tend to find is from a filtering capability, they're probably gonna have more limitations than you would even have in your own house. What you probably wanna do is reach out to your specific school district and find out what those limitations are. And I do wanna bring up one point, is that once again, don't think the technical controls are going to protect for everything. So, for example, I know some Chromebooks have disabled chat messaging. So students can't message each other directly. But if students have poor values, if they misbehave, there's always a way to get around the technology. So, for example, nowadays, if students want to text and message each other, but they have text or messaging removed from the Chromebook, They'll simply pull up Google Docs, have a shared Google Docs page, and then they'll just type messages in that single Google document, and then the, that will be their way to communicate. So long story short, I tend to find Chromebooks have even stronger filtering limitations than you would normally have at home. But once again, if the kids don't have the right values or the right behaviors, even in third grade, they're gonna start figuring out ways to get around it. That's why I always come back to that start with the education first. 
All right, thanks. Uh, someone asks, what about teaching them about privacy and resources? Um, absolutely. And uh, keep in mind, everybody kind of has a different definition of privacy, and that can also get into behavior. So like I mentioned earlier, I, I never thought of this. My 16-year-old told me how he's already seeing online some kids are misbehaving. And when it's a Zoom online e-learning session and people are scaring, sh sharing screens, they're taking screenshots of kids online and then making fun of them. Maybe, maybe the kid was looking goofy or tired at that moment. So that's an example of bullying, but that's also an example of privacy violation. So we want to be sure we're not violating other people's privacy. But then again, we want to make sure our kids are protecting their own privacy. Also, you know, limit what you share with others. Be concerned about what websites, you know, things like that. So everyone I tend to find has a slightly different definition of what privacy is and or a different definition of how important it is. But whatever your attitude towards privacy is, absolutely make sure you're communicating that to your children all right thanks uh do you rec recommend windows parent controls um absolutely for younger kids so what i've done you know for the young kids you know limit what websites they can go to or if they're young what you can actually do is reverse it you know good old whitelisting in other words a lot of times with parental controls uh, you basically say everything's bad and you can only go to these websites. And I'll be honest, when they're five, 10 years old, that's probably good enough. You can go into whitelisting mode. When they get older, junior high, especially high school, you know, if you're going to do parental controls, you're probably better off blacklisting. You know, hey, these are bad sites. Or what tends to happen is it's not by site, it's by category. You know, no online gambling websites, no online you know, adult-oriented websites, drug websites, hate websites. Uh, that's how a lot of filtering works. It's not by specific site, but by category. And then there's other things too that happens on um, you know, Windows parental controls. One of the things I really do like about parental controls is you can set times when they can and can't be online. So you can say, only can go online between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m., can only be online for four to six hours. Keep in mind now with e-learning, kids have to be online. So uh, the parental controls nowadays have actually gotten better and better and more granular control. They also have them for mobile devices. So for mobile devices, you could say, hey, my kids can only use these apps. They can only play these apps for this long and things like that. So what I tend to find is with the parental controls, what I personally use is not so much the filtering, it's the time controls and the time tracking to track how long they've been on them. But no, absolutely, both when Microsoft Windows and Apple for the uh, uh, mobile devices, I don't use Android much. So folks, I don't have a lot of experience with Android, but Android folks I've worked with, there are parental controls there also. So absolutely, I'd go with them. But like I said, as the kids get older, it's probably going to be less and less effective. All right, Lance, this next one asks, any recommendations on quality porn blocking software? Uh, he lists one that he's used, but he says his teenager has discovered ways to beat it. Yep, yep, yep. So when you're you know, wanting to block websites like adult content or hate or things like that, You've got to keep in mind, there's two general ways to do it. You do it on the network or you do it on the device. Both have their problems. If you do filtering on the network, and I would recommend something like OpenDNS. If you do it on the network, what happens when they're not on the network? And keep in mind, especially with mobile devices now, they can use their cellular connection for data. So that's now bypassing your network. Or they can go to a friend's house or something like that. So the other one is then you have to do it on the device. <clears throat> you could potentially use parental controls and or, you know, I'm going to go back a couple slides. For mobile devices, there's some software there at the bottom, Teen Safe, Mobile Watch, those, right, those are just three of many. So then you could, like I said, do it at the network, do it at the device, do it at both, but keep in mind, you're still going to be limited because what happens when they go to their friend's house and they're on a gaming console? The gaming console has a browser. 
What happens if they borrow a device from a friend or things like that? So if you really want to lock it down, you're probably going to have to do it at the network and the device level. And for device, there's software. What other questions? Thanks. Is there a guide to setting up non-privileged accounts on the various platforms? Is there a guide? There probably there should be, but creating an account so it's non-privileged should be relatively easy. So for example, on Macs, Mac computers, when you create account, it says, do you want to, there's basically three different levels, admin, standard, or parental control. Um, and then what I tend to do is for my young kids, like for my third grader, I'd go into the parental control option where I can control what they do, where they can go. For my high school, I just give them standard. And then for me, myself, I give admin. It's basically when you create the account. Uh, for Windows, it's been a couple a while since I've used Windows. I'm assuming it's the same. You can also change the uh, privilege of an account. You'll just have to go into the uh, section where you can control accounts. So it should be pretty easy regardless of the platform you use. But yeah, I'd recommend that your kids not have admin or privileged access. All right, thanks. Uh, it sounds like the relationship between parents and schools and teachers is very important to e-learning. Are you aware of school resources for parents that support parents the best? Ooh, fantastic question. I would say I don't know of anything real good right now. And I'll be honest, this is why. Basically, this whole e-learning thing happened within the past week. And you have a huge, huge amount of change in chaos. Some teachers are adapting to it very well simply because they're very comfortable with technology and or the class lends itself very easy. Some teachers are struggling and or because they're having to figure out how to do it. So for example, my thir uh, third grader, he has band. Well, they're now having him record himself playing the instrument and then submitting it and uploading it online. So I think what happens is teachers are figuring this out as they go. So a couple of things. A, it's not going to be perfect, and there's still a lot of bumps in the road. Two, even if you have a question and you email the teacher, they're going to be overwhelmed. So my wife told me this morning, she's getting emails from the teachers, and she's a little concerned about the teachers because the emails are coming at midnight, one in the morning, two in the morning. So what's happening is the teachers are staying up late trying to figure this out. So I don't know personally, it's, and if somebody does, please post it in the chat channel and share on how to do this. But A, don't expect to be perfect. B, expect it to change over time. C, absolutely reach out to the teacher, say, you know, hey, can you clarify? Can I help? Also, what I've, I've been doing is every once in a while is I email the teachers and I'm just saying, Hey, thank you for everything you're doing and hang in there. A little, you know, just an email every now and then emotionally encourage them probably would be appreciated. But if you do email them a question and you don't get a response right away, it's not that they're ignoring us, it's they're absolutely overwhelmed. So I don't know of a single resource that has all the answers. I don't think such a resource exists because I don't think anybody has the, all the answers. And if, even if they did, things are probably still going to change over the next week or two. So that's why I say work with your kids, encourage with your kids. If you're a little frustrated or you need a little additional e-learning, my number one favorite website for e-learning is Khan Academy. So K-H-A-N academy.org. Some of you know what I'm talking about, especially if your kids are struggling with things like science, physics, or math. It is a wealth of information. So if, if you're a little concerned that your school's a little slow on the pickup, they're going to get there, but you can do additional training at Khan Academy. All right, thanks. Uh, I'm not sure if someone's asking this question. They said they just said guest Wi-Fi. Maybe they're suggesting another place. Oh, you yep, 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 yep. So one of the things you can do is the challenge with this whole e-learning is while you're e-learning, you're also probably have parents working from home. So one of the things you can do is create a virtual separation of home network. So kids are on one virtual network and then parents, especially parents that are working, are on a separate nether network. 
which is fine. If you want to do that, by all means. But to be honest, I think the risk model is not so much sharing computers on the same network. We want to be sure your kids are not act physically accessing any work uh, devices. So the last thing you want is your 10-year-old playing Minecraft on that laptop that got issued by work because then they accidentally infect, infect your work computer. So virtual separation, absolutely, if you want to go that way, but make sure you have that physical separation and make sure kids aren't uh, physically accessing any of your work devices. All right, thanks. Um, the, the same person gave a tip, never allow anything on your internal network that you do not manage. So I think it's related to the, the guest Wi-Fi. Yep, so yep, if you want to put the kids Chromebooks on your uh, guest network, absolutely. That's a good way to, you know, a little virtual isolation there. All right, thanks. Um, my wife and I found that another student was bullied in a chat room, but no one spoke up about it. I'm going to talk to the school about it. Any advice when I approach the school? So absolutely. Um, when you approach the school, I would try to go in very understanding and helpful because I know when it comes to bullying, emotions get very, very, very charged. It's a very sensitive uh, thing for me. I mean, like I said, junior high was not fun. I was the little nerd everyone liked to pick on. So it always breaks my heart when it sees it happen. But let, when you approach the school, try not to be antagonistic. Try to be, hey, I found a problem. What can we do to solve the problem? And what I, the, the, what I tend to find is when bullying starts happening online, the best thing is to catch it fast. Because if it gets out of control, then things can get ugly. Um, and then, you know, that could be reaching out to the school, maybe reaching out to some parents. If it's happening on Facebook, you reach out to Facebook abuse and things like that. But absolutely. And this is the number one reason why it's so important that kids talk to you, because you want if there's a bullying situation, you want them to be talking to you right when it starts. If it's been going on for a while and things are gotten really ugly, it's harder and harder to resolve. For security geeks out there, it's like an incident. We all know the sooner you respond to an incident, the easier it is to manage the damage. In some ways, bullying is no different. It's just instead of trying to manage data, we're managing emotions. So absolutely, please reach out to your school. They may not be aware of it. They may already have a program, but the program hasn't kicked in place. So definitely talk to them about it. All right, thanks. We'll squeeze this last question is a question in. Which OS is better for younger kids, four to ten years old? Mac OS, Linux, or Windows? Interested in monitoring parental control? Which have better software at the device level? Okay, so for mobile devices, your really choices are Android or Apple. So for mobile devices, if you really want to control in lockdown, I would suggest Android. Just because of the nature of the operating system, third-party vendors can get in at a much lower level at the base operating system, so you tend to be able to both monitor, control, and filter more. Whereas with Apple operating iOS, you tend to be more limited by what Apple provides. Now, for actual computers, ultimately, I would say it's probably whatever operating system you're the most comfortable with, because that's the one you'll be able to work with the most. Windows would probably have the most third-party options. Linux, if you're really hardcore nerd, you'd probably really be able to dig in there. 20 years ago when I started in cybersecurity, it was firewalls. That's where I started it. And people would ask me, Lance, what's the best operating system for firewalls? And I learned over time, the one you feel the most comfortable with because that's the one you can secure the best. So I would say whichever operating system you're the most comfortable with, for a computer, for mobile devices, you're probably going to have more monitoring and filtering options uh, with Android, just because of how the operating systems control. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lance, for your great presentation, which helps bring this.